Hi, uh, good evening, uh, afternoon or indeed morning, depending on where in the world you are. Uh, in a minute, I will introduce today's speaker. But first, I just wanted to say a few words on the British Council's work. Uh, the British Council works here in Israel to advance collaboration, cooperation and friendship between the two countries. Our focus is on scientific research, an area in which both are world leading. To maintain the highest possible levels of research, it requires that the best minds can work together across borders to push forward the boundaries of our knowledge. As a member of the UK Israel Science Council, today's speaker is at the forefront of helping achieve this goal. Without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Khermona Sorek, a molecular neuroscientist at the Edmund and Lily Safra Center for Brain Sciences and at the Institute of Life Sciences at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. When we talk of world leading research and researchers, it is exactly people like Professor Sorek that we have in mind. Her work spans a wide range of fields in neuroscience and biological chemistry. And today she will be talking about her work on the sex differences in the response to psychiatric medication. Her presentation will be followed by lots of time for questions, but do please feel free to ask your questions in the text box on the right at any time. And I will put those questions to Professor Sorek after her talk. So over to our speaker. Thank you very much, Ariel. It's a very great pleasure to be here today. And this answer is very simple. Psychiatric medications and other medications affect women and men differently because we are all special in different ways. And there are differences between men and women. What I will try to tell you about today is how does this affect one network of communication in the brain which is mediated by a neurotransmitter, a chemical compound called acetylcholine. And I would like to link that with genes. We are molecular neuroscientists. We look at these genes. The pink thing over here is called microRNA. It's a very small gene and it affects the functioning of other genes. And this over here is a transfer RNA, another small RNA that takes amino acids and brings them to be uh, to create a protein molecule. So my major argument is the genes that control this network in our brain are controlled by other genes, small ones, that keep the uh, cycle going and that these processes are not the same in the men and women uh, brains. So how did we come to look into this topic? Uh, two years ago, two papers appear, appeared in science. One of the genetics, the DNA level, one of the RNA gene expression level. And both uh, articles had the same message, forget about nervous system disease. There is a spectrum just like autism and the patients with depression, with schizophrenia would actually fall on this spectrum. And that was very interesting. It was suggested by a prominent consortium of neuroscientists. So I read the papers. And I was astonished not to find anything in these two articles on the differences between men and women. We do know that men develop schizophrenia about 10 years earlier than women. We know that women with depression, with bipolar disorder, suffer much more severe symptoms than men. So if that is the case, where are the differences? I was so puzzled that I went into the data that based on which these two papers have been written. And what I found was that they had a very serious database. So they had brain tissues from 139 schizophrenic patients and 82 bipolar depressed patients. And they created what they called spectral which were 
was very nice, except that if you divided the data into men and women separately, the spectrum looked less nice. So that induced my interest into looking into the differences. What is done differently in the men and women brain to create these changes? So this became a study that was published a couple of years ago, and it was a joint effort by two PhD students then, both are doctors now. Sebastian Lobentanzer, a student of mine from the University of Frankfurt. So there is a lot of international collaboration even before the corona. And Geula Hanin, who was a PhD student in my lab over here in Jerusalem, and she's now at Cambridge, UK, as a postdoctoral fellow. So what Sebastian and Geula asked is, what are the differences between men and women in the brain of these patients, schizophrenic and depressed ones? Can we run a joint analysis, what we call a meta-analysis, to focus on specific differences? Can we build a network on those differences that relate to our neurotransmitter of interest? And can we build a network out of that and hopefully indicate new applications, new medications? So this is what we've done. First thing we, we've done was to compare the data, schizophrenic to bipolar, men to women. By the way, do you know that about 100 years ago in England, when a little boy was born, they bought for him pink clothing. When a little girl was born, they bought for her blue clothing. Somewhere along the past century, this switched off, we have no idea. But today, we uh, associate blue with male and pink with female. What you see here is the outcome of our basic analysis. And what we found was changes in a lot of parameters that control this cholinergic network. You could uh, mimic this network with a kind of mobile phone or, or email. What were the changes we saw in men? Response to organophosphates. So organophosphates are the poisons with which Alexei Navalny had been poisoned very recently. So this is popular with some people at least. And in women instead, we saw a change in inflammation. Surprisingly enough, our network mediated by this neurotransmitter acetylcholine blocks inflammation. So we have two associations that are very different in men and women with mental disease. How come? What's going on there? So I'd like to mention here another great lady scientist, Professor Rita Levi Montalcini, who won the Nobel Prize for her discovery of a brain growth factor. And uh, because of her discovery, this was tried as a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. It didn't work. And when we look at the complexity of the brain's network, and this is only one network, only the acetylcholine network, you see that there are different links, different brain regions send messages through different networks. The brain is immensely complex and we need to uh, associate with that and acknowledge that. So can we look at the genes, those small microRNAs that are expressed in the brain of the patients with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and associate them with sex? So I'm not saying gender, which is a sociological term differentiating between people who are men or women in their eyes, in the society eyes, but I'm talking now about people who were born, females or males. Now, what you see in this network 
are those small microRNAs that Sebastian identified as associated with males, blue, with females, pink, with both the green ones and opposite ones, which are the yellow. So there are huge differences. How can we check that? Well, one way we could check that is to run experiments in cultured cells. And you know what? I've been using cell culture experiments for several decades. I never think about whether this cell culture comes from a man or a woman. There is one cell line that all scientists use and was derived from the tumor of a woman called Henrietta Lacks. And we know that this is a woman because the cells are named after her. They're called HeLa cells. So in those cells, we do know that they come from a female. We know their shape, but what we wanted to find out is what happens if we take a brain-derived cell line from a male or a female, would those show differences in the microRNAs? And what we did was that what we found was that a female derived cell line shows changes when we induce the acetylcholine communication, mainly in pink genes. So it's a female related gene. <clears throat> And when we find out what are the targets of those microRNAs, which genes are affected, and we associate they, these genes with either male or female by blue or pink dots, what we found was that in schizophrenia, we found a lot of male associated genes. And you know what? Schizophrenic patients, men schizophrenic patients, become addicted to nicotine. Nicotine induces the acetylcholine pathway, whereas the uh, female genes were associated with, sorry, were associated with bipolar, and we did say that female patients with bipolar disorder develop deep depression, and some genes are shared. So there is a spectrum. Everyone whose mental capacities are impaired would have certain impairments also in gene expression. But some of the impairments are more apparent in males, others are more apparent in females, and many are shared. So there are differences. How come? Why are there differences? After our paper appeared about the schizophrenic and bipolar patients, I received an invitation from this journal called Trends in Pharmacological Sciences to actually dissect those differences. And that was the final PhD project of another talented student in my lab, and I need to say here, that I'm particularly uh, fortunate in attracting really great students. Alon Simchovic, Alon Simchovic Gesher, is, uh, has been an MD PhD student in my lab uh, and a winner of a Chloro Fellowship, really particularly talented researcher who combines the clinical and basic research uh, capacities and Alon looked into the differences and found that the differences can be divided into diverse directions. First of all, the pharmacokinetics, which means you take a pill, how fast will it get into your blood, into your system? And apparently males and females show differences in the capacity to digest, to bring those drugs into their system. How fast will the, the drug get into the brain? And clozapine and ketamine are known psychiatric drugs that show 
dramatic differences between males and females in the rate of the kinetics. That's not the only change. There are changes in side effects, and these are very important. For example, females who get a drugs like risperidone risper might have a risk of bone mineral depletion, which means they'll have a risk of bone fractures just because they take this drug and males do not have that danger. There are other drugs who even cause drug induced psychosis. So the dangers should be known and should be studied and should be uh, prevented as best as possible. The drug efficacy is different. Alzheimer's disease treatment in the whole Western world, Alzheimer's patients get a drug called donepezil. And this drug affects women and men with different efficacy. Major depressive patients get this drug again very different efficacy between males and females. Now you may ask the question, which of course came up to my mind too, how come? Why didn't we know that when those drugs were developed? We now live in a world that is acutely aware of the tests that involve approval of drug use. But most of the currently established drugs were initially tested only in male mice or rats. Why is that? Because the rodents, like humans, do not have a, a monthly cycle of hormone changes. So it is much cheaper to use only males in experiments. That means that half of humanity, this half, is being treated with drugs that were initially developed for the other half. And they were only tested in human beings after what we call the preclinical research phase. There are also chromosomal differences. Women have two X chromosomes. Males have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. And there's a famous study done a in Israel, looking at the ancient genes carried on the Y chromosomes of Kohanim and found that 90% of them carry most of the gene markers on the Y chromosome, which was delivered from one generation of Kohanim to the next. So Karl Skoretsky, uh, uh, then at the Technion right now, the dean of the Faculty of Medicine in Tzfat was responsible for that study. So there are chromosomal differences as well. And the expression changes along the sex chromosomes show you that this is another level of complexity by which drug effects might differ. The microRNAs also might differ between males and females. So all of that brings us to the issue that X and Y chromosome activities are subject to different regulation, both by short controllers and by long controllers, and they would change how the brain reacts to drugs and what happens then thereafter. All of this talks about men and women as if they were all at the same age. But that again is changing. So the United Nations put through a comparison of the populations of human beings from 1950 to 2015. And these trees show you that in 1950, the major part of the human race was aged less than 20 years. Today, this is a minor part of the human population. The major parts are up to 60, and there is a huge fraction of people who 
did not exist almost in 1950. So we have a population where the Western world uh, average age increases insistently, and that implies that we also need to look at the impact of drugs, not only between males and females, but between young and aged males and females. And a new study, or several new studies actually, shows now that the communication system we focus on, the cholinergic system, changes its potency with age. So that people under the age of 50 who are treated with drugs that block this network, like antihistamines like Benadryl to stop sneezing, uh, anti-mimetics, they react differently from people after the age of 50, who might have a risk of cognitive decline. And we still don't know to what extent this differs between men and women, but we do know that women's life expectancy is considerably longer. So that is another level of complexity. And that brings me to risks of disease of the aged individuals and to the question in what way those differ. What are the genes that control those? And the disease we work on recently at the lab is ischemic stroke. So you can block or minimize the risk of ischemic stroke by no smoking, going through annual checkups, eating right, controlling one's weight, regular exercise. But many people still develop stroke. One in six people will experience this disease. And what we see now is that we need to find new ways to treat that. And stroke affects more men than women, just like Parkinson's disease and inverse to Alzheimer's disease. So we have differences and the differences affect also inflammation, which is controlled, surprise, surprise, by our cholinergic network. So we tried a molecular approach to stroke. And this is the data we see, just to share with you. And we find the sequences, and I look at the sequences and I say, I know this region, I remember it. This is a fragment of transfer RNA, the small RNAs that bring amino acids to proteins. So Kasia Vinek, who is a, an LSEC postdoctoral fellow at the lab, he uh, looked at these genes. And just to show you what these genes do, I bring a, a beautiful example to my mind. What is a conveyor belt? And the conveyor belt here is, of course, a Charlie Chaplin's conveyor belt, but the transfer RNAs run a parallel conveyor belt. Our paper just appeared yesterday in case of anyone being interested. And what it showed is the transfer RNA fragments replace the microRNAs in the stroke blood cells. And we called it changing of the guards, which of course links to the British Council just nicely. And we hope that these could be produced as drugs to treat stroke patients. So we would like to find out to what extent stress affects brains uh, of men and women differently, to what extent stroke affects them differently, and stroke is a risk of Alzheimer's disease as is stress. So this is what we would like to know. We also might mention that the coronavirus risk is smaller uh, relatively in women compared to men, but that's thanks to another gene called dancer, and that uh, 
what we are looking at now in the lab is how the network of cholinergic neurons connects between stress and structure. This is the work of another very talented LSEC PhD student, Nadav Yayon, who is on his way to Cambridge, UK for postdoctoral studies. Now, I heard many years ago from a colleague that her son said, we are the collaborators, and I agree. This is my newest granddaughter, and she's definitely a collaborator. But the people we need to thank are the patient volunteers, our collaborators, clinicians, and basic researchers. I talked to you about the cholinergic nervous system, microRNAs, men and women, and transfer RNA fragments, the way they affect men and women drug responses at different ages, and the way we can link that to DNA. I need to thank all the students, some of whom I mentioned, the foundations that support this research. And I'd like to end by showing you Margaret Atwood, who says, never was the difference between men and women so important as it is today. And thank you all for listening. Okay. OK, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sorek. Um, <clears throat> we, that was a really fascinating talk, uh, and we have a few questions here already. Um, and I'd encourage those listening, of course, to, to keep asking questions as they come up. But perhaps I'll start um, when people register, they have the opportunity to ask some questions. So I might put some of those to you first, and then we'll move uh, to the ones that have been asked uh, during your presentation. Uh, one of the questions that we we had um, at registration was um, whether there are differences. Um, so, so one of them is, are some of the differences in reactions to medication actually differences in reporting caused by gender roles into which people are socialized? For example, in autism, it is under recognized in women, so they unknowingly might force themselves to mask. Yeah. Does this skew mental health diagnosis and uh, skew the reactions and the feedback? So uh, this is a very relevant question mm -hmm. and it's relevant at two levels. First, it is true that autism affect, affects males more than females mm -hmm. at the biological level. It is yeah. also true that the reaction to autism had a gender related impact in that in the 1960s a, a very well-known clinician said of course mothers who are too much interested in academic inspirations would have a greater risk of having autistic children this is total rubbish so <laughs> there are links both at the biology and at the sociology levels but uh, unfortunately autism affects males much more than females. This is being studied these, studied these days, both in England and in Israel. I don't hear you, Ariel. Ariel, I can I hear me now. Oh, OK. OK, Thanks. I'll ask one more question uh, that was asked previously, and sure. then we'll move to the, to the live ones. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a question, uh, maybe more of a, a historical sociological question, but yeah, which you might uh, want to comment on. Uh, is there a moment in history we can look back to where men and women were socially equal to compare, uh, you know, th this research to? So this uh, brings me to my readings of Robert Graves. OK, so the ancient Greek tribes had a female dominated and male dominated tribes, but uh, they were not equal just as much. So I, I would like to see a society which provides equal rights to both sexes. And see the effects there. Yeah. Great. Um, I'll move on to the questions. We, we have actually two questions. I can ask them together. Uh, they, they relate specifically to um, ADHD uh, drugs um, and whether, um, how much do we know about 
the effects of these drugs have on the brain in the long run and the differences uh, in male and female uh, reaction to them. Okay, so I, I believe that ADHD is also more common in males than females. Mm -hmm. The drugs uh, have started to be used not too long ago. So far, mm -hmm. the experience is very good. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any negative outcome, and I'm sure this is being looked at as we are speaking. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, another question I'll take here um, that we had from previously. Um, there was a question uh, about, do we know anything about uh, the insight in terms of sex differences in psychiatric medication withdrawal? Uh, yes, there are studies about that and there are differences just as much as there are differences when people start taking psychiatric drugs, there are differences of withdrawal. These drugs affect the way the brain functions mm -hmm. all the way through the uh, genes that produce the RNA product. You know, it's it's a real pleasure to say RNA and think everyone knows what RNA is now, thanks to the Pfizer and Moderna drugs. Because before people would say, excuse me, what is RNA? And now the whole world knows what that is. So yeah, uh, there are differences between males and females at every level. And we have to accept that. And I would say that the FDA today, when you develop a new drug, they would like you to prove that it's equal to or better than a previous drug that existed for this particular disease. Mm -hmm. Except that the previous drugs were only tested in male mice. Mm -hmm. So what are we gaining here? I think that it's time to change the initial level of research and say we need to ask initially. We are developing a drug for males and for me, females. We are testing the impact of that treatment in males and females separately. I do that when I get papers to review and it's not very well received. People say, but that's the way things have been done. Well, not always the way things have been done is the best. Interesting. And, and if, if we if we expand, I guess, the, the topic further, you know, you say that um, obviously there's this difference in drug reaction between males and females. Are there differences? Uh, you, you sort of touched on this a little in terms of the differences between ages and how drugs are metabolized, but also in terms of um, ethnic origin or, or, or you know, a geographic origin. It, it's potentially the, the variation between people is quite large. Yeah. How do we deal with that? We practically don't deal with that. OK. And the differences are huge mm -hmm. and should be attended to. I've been, you know, about one year ago when people used to travel. I went to a conference in the United States and I learned that Alzheimer's disease risk is 50% larger in Hispanic uh, uh, people of the United States, which I have no idea about. And nobody knows yet if this is because of education, economic reasons mm -hmm. or genetic origin. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it needs to be looked at it, uh, with differences attended to, I agree. And, and is, is this perhaps, you know, you hear the buzzword personalized medicine. Is this, this is an aspect of it, right? Right. People talk about personalized medicine a lot, but what they mean is designing a drug for one person or, or for one tumor type, mm -hmm. which is great, but I think that the, at the very first level, we should do personalized medicine bef between men and women, mm -hmm. which has not been done yet. And even at, at that most basic level, it's uh... it, it's extremely important. And as you have seen, it uh, it reflects many levels of how fast the drug is uh, digested, mm -hmm. how effective it is, what are the side effects 
what happens under withdrawal, which was a question that is well justified. And I forgot to say, if anyone uh, would like to receive a more detailed answer, feel free to send me an email. I can be found at the website of ELSEC and the Hebrew University, and I usually answer my emails. Thank you. That's it's good to hear. Um, I've, I've got a few more questions that have come in. One, maybe we, we should go back to basics a bit. Um, someone wants to know uh, what is RNA? Ah, great. <laughs> OK, so let's look at our uh, genome as a pyramid. At the top, we have DNA. Each of us, us has a different DNA from anyone else except for identical twins. OK, mm -hmm. so we know how the DNA looks. We can sequence the DNA. It's getting less and less expensive. And this is what people refer to when they say personalized medicine. Let's adapt treatment to the mutations you carry as a person and find out what fits you best. Mm -hmm. But the differences between DNA in males and females relate to the changes in chromosomes. DNA is what makes the chromosomes. That's the top of the pyramid. The second level is RNA. So DNA gets copied, transcribed into RNA, which is another nucleic acid. And this is the, we usually call the DNA the hardware and the RNA the software, as if this was a computer, then the DNA is the computer. And the, uh, the RNA is the software that carries the instructions of how that computer works. And the RNA gets translated into proteins, which are the bottom of the pyramid. Traditionally, all drugs were directed to proteins. Today, we can use the RNA because we know how the DNA looks. We can use the RNA to make drugs. So the RNA vaccine, injects or will inject us all with an RNA that encodes a protein of the virus and the body will uh, detect that and say, OK, I need to get protected against this. And then we'll all produce antibodies and hopefully we'll get back to traveling to conferences and for leisure and see each other and as my daughter-in-law says, I need a hug. We all need a hug and we all miss that for a while now. Good answer. Um, a few more questions here uh, and we, we have a bit more time. So uh, someone had asked, um, do, do we know, are there drugs that we actually know that are now being developed based on sex differences? Or, or is, is, is there more just the, the personalized medicine, like much more um, niche production? Is that, is that more the mood of the game? Do, do you know anything about any actual examples where, where these differences have been taken into account? Well, to begin with, things yeah. are tested at clinical trials, mm -hmm. which is a relief because we all remember the very bad experience of thalidomide, which was not tested in women when it was developed against headache and mm -hmm. the terrible outcome was the birth of children without limbs. Mm -hmm. So and today the, the regulations are very strict about that mm -hmm. and every drug after the research phase is being tested both in males and in females. As I'm sure the new immunization against the coronavirus is being tested both in males and in females. Uh, drugs are developed to female specific ailments like ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. right, which hardly ever would hurt men, or breast cancer, which is very rare in men. But other than that, drugs are not developed specifically for males and females, mm. which is a shame because we know today that uh, not only psychiatric diseases, but also heart attacks have different symptoms mm. for men and women. But nobody develops uh, cardiac medications all the way from 
cell culture and animal experiments in the lab to reach the client? So it's a good question. Uh, and are there are there any drugs that after testing are seen, you know, uh, obviously not designed from the beginning, but seem to be much more oh, effective yeah. and prescribed? Right. From the other. So I, I have a, a personal example of that. Again, last year I was flying to China. There was a conference of the Israel Science Foundation and the Chinese Science Foundation. So a lot of us were flying to Shanghai in, in, from the airport in Israel. Mm -hmm. And I see a friend from Tel Shomer, and he takes a pill and he's gone for the entire flight. And I'm envious. Mm -hmm. So when we land, I ask him, you know, what did you take? He said, I took this and that pill, but you need to be careful because when it was taken by women, mm -hmm. it was discovered that it's effective much longer so that women took a pill when they went to bed and then they got up in the morning and drove to work and they had a traffic accident because they were still dizzy. So now it is recommended for women to take half a pill. This is a classical example. Nobody tested it in females separate from males and found the, the drug adaptivity. Oh, interesting. interesting. Yeah. Um, I think maybe one one or two other questions we have time for. Um, I have here one, so it says uh, you mentioned earlier that specific antihistamine can affect cognition later in life. Yeah, yeah. And the question here specifically is, um, you know, it, it, could this be the case in ADHD or ADD medicines? Um, uh, and if, if so, why? And if not, why not? Um, but I guess more generally, uh, do we know of other medicines? So ADD, ADHD medicine specifically, but if we open that out, are there other, other medicines that we, yeah. this is it's a, it's a very good question because the uh, some of the antihistamines that we are warned against mm -hmm. are sold over the counter. You don't even need a medical uh, uh, prescription to take them, like Benadryl. So these, definitely affect men and women differently. Mm -hmm. And we all need to be aware of that and careful of that because mm -hmm. the risk here is increased risk of dementia and we really don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. So aging related differences should be checked. I don't think they were yet. Mm -hmm. So several studies exist that say age is a risk, but they do not say if age is um, more of a risk in men or women or vice versa. Okay, and, and uh, okay, specifically for ADHD medication. ADHD is at the other line okay. of the spectrum in children. So there we have a different concept which is of interest. Okay. Like three generations ago, a lot of children died in childhood because of acute diseases that today are treated earlier and better. Mm -hmm. So today we protect all of the children, including those who are very sensitive mm -hmm. in terms of immune system, but mm -hmm. the immune system keeps talking to the brain. So we, we could say that ADHD medications that are given to children might bear different impact in children with higher or weaker immune system capacities. I think we have time for just one more very quick question. Uh, I have one here. It says, what, what about blood types? Do we know of their effect in terms of uh, medication or reaction to medication? So blood types. Oh, OK. That's a very good question. Especially since there is at least one mutation that I know in the cholinergic pathway that changes the blood type. OK. But I don't know that it was tested. And and it is a very good reason to, to check. There is, again, a a story that relates here to Tasmania and the Aborigines of Australia. 
they had uh, these beautiful drawings that people didn't understand until they explained that actually they show the blood types and who, who is allowed to marry the other in terms of cousins who were not supposed to get married because their children will not be healthy. So uh, again, this is an ancient history that was known to these tribes and blood types do affect a lot of different genes. Mm -hmm. So it's an excellent question. I don't think that it had been tested in terms of drug efficacy. Excellent. I think on, on that note, I like it uh, when an event ends with a possible new line for research <laughs> on the <Absolutely>. top. <laughs> on that note, we're, we're out of time. Thank you very, very much, Professor Sarek. That was very interesting. Um, and to others listening, this will be put online on our YouTube channel and possibly also on the Hebrew University's site. Um, but if, if you check back on our site, we, we will have more information if you want to send it to others or if anyone else wants to listen. So thank you very much, Professor Eck, uh, and good night. Thank you for the invitation. It has been a pleasure. Good night.